Oh, just on a cruise stop. This side. We'll call the Wilmer City Council work session to order for Monday, January 8th at 5.15 p.m. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to make any comments? I appreciate it. Seeing and hearing none, we'll go to the first item on the agenda. Uh, and it's a RAC 8 and website presentation. Mr. Holland. Mayor and Council, I've asked um, our IT department to come here tonight. And you're going to see that over the next uh, first six months of this year. Uh, every month we're going to have a different department come before the Council. And I've asked them to highlight some of their current uh, projects and events that they're working on right now. And then also to project what we're trying to accomplish in 2018. And then lastly, just to highlight any issues or concerns that they might have that might be an in interest to the council. And, you know, when I first got here, I toured the uh, TV station and I talked uh, with Ross and his staff about the website and some changes that were made last year. And, and believe it or not, I, I did see this significant change actually occurred during my transition here. So I noticed the change in the, uh, the website. Um, but there's a lot of things going on in IT, and I think that it's a useful tool. And maybe more importantly, it's no longer just one of those things that wouldn't it be nice if we had a nice website or wouldn't it be nice? No, it's, it's now uh, a requirement of most cities. And so I think it's very important uh, that we keep abreast of what's going on and make sure that we properly use our resources to make sure we get the biggest bang for the buck. So with that, I will stop talking and I will let them give their presentation. And the other thing that I have uh, also want to say before I forget is I've asked for more videos on our website. And because when you go to a website, it gets very stagnant. And you click on a name and it says, you know, you know, Tom and he's in this department. But if you go and it says, you know, wastewater department and there's a video and you actually see what they do down there and they're measuring things they're talking about how exciting it is to work in that department and all the achievements and the future developments in there <clears throat> it, it comes alive and so we're trying to do that and I know this past six months I've shared with you uh, some samples of their work and I've been very impressed with their department and with Dave, who's here tonight, with the professionalism of their videos. And uh, we had uh, it Sarah in the wastewater treatment facility. She could have a job, I think, on TV. I mean, it was very professional. I was just blown away. Uh, some of our own employees uh, on how their uh, presentation comes across. And I was just telling Judy tonight, uh, they do a very good job, uh, although I've seen myself on TV since I've arrived, and I don't like my presence. <laughs> I don't know who that guy is talking. It's uh, the camera. It's the camera, you know, and that you know, adds weight to me and everything, so it takes away my hair. But uh, anyway, I guess I will stop this time. So, Dave? Mr. Mayor and Council, Dave Hill and Mayor with RAC and the IT department. I'm um, going to be presenting just a couple videos tonight and talking about Facebook and our website as well. Um, the videos that you're about to see are um, videos, the concept isn't necessarily new because we did do something like this in the past, um, but when Mr. Holland asked to do some of these videos, it was kind of a timely event in that um, when this first video that we put together came out was around the time you'll remember um, where we had some high fecal counts in, in Foot Lake. And so when that came out, um, there was a lot of speculation as to why that was happening. And I got together with Sarah and said, why don't we, this is, the time is now to put together a video. Why don't we put together a video that'll explain really the facts, who, what, why, where, when, and what's going on um, with, with the lake with these high fecal counts. So we put that together, and so we're gonna show that video um, first, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, one of the other videos we've done uh, presently that's out on Facebook. Do you wanna introduce your team, or do you wanna just introduce them as you go? Ross? Ross? Oh, yep. You want well, to probably uh, basically, Dave 
is uh, solely responsible for the videos that you'll see here. He pretty much does the coordination behind uh, organizing with staff or any uh, citizens in terms of uh, setting up the video, editing it, and organization on it. Uh, the ideas for it pretty much come from the two of us sitting down and just brainstorming ideas of ways to kind of show the citizens of the community what the city is really doing here and there might be some projects that have questions that they're not fully aware of why is this getting done or what's going on at this building, why is city staff doing this and this is really just there to show the projects that the city is promoting and um, some of the reasons behind things that do occur. So. <clears throat> And with that, I'll let Dave uh, show you the first video that he did in the series. In the city of Wilmer, we test the beach at Robbins Island because the city wants to be good stewards for the citizens who are using the beach and they want to make sure it's safe. It's not a state requirement. It is something that the city decided to go above and beyond doing so they can ensure the residents and the citizens who's ever using the beach will be safe while they're using it. So about May through September is when we want to do it, when people are using the water. So we go out once a week, usually Monday mornings. We get a water sample um, using sterile equipment and then we bring that back to our lab and they take a measured amount of the water and they send it through a certain filter and they put it in a growth medium that is the absolute perfect conditions to grow this type of bacteria. It has to incubate for 24 hours so the next day we have our result. And we know if the beach is safe and it can stay open or if it needs to be closed. So weekly the city of Wilmer goes out and tests for fecal coliform bacteria. The fecal coliform bacteria are a group of bacteria that's present in all warm-blooded animals, birds and mammals and humans, and it's present in all of their digestive systems. So it's an indicator that there may be fecal pollutants or feces present in the water. The fecal coliform bacteria is not what's harmful, but it indicates that the bacteria and pathogens that are harmful is also likely in that water. The sources of our fecal coliform bacteria in Robbins Island is mainly the geese and the wildlife population. Other sources could be pet waste that washes off um, during rain events so if people aren't picking up after their dogs. Other wildlife that that washes in with rain events. Um, leaking septic systems can also be a source of it. However, we don't have individual septic systems around these lakes. They're all serviced by the municipal sanitary sewer system for the city of Wilmer. Rain events often cause the levels of fecal coliform bacteria to increase in surface waters because that will wash all of the goose droppings that are up on the beach into the water and it will also wash all of the pet waste that's on lawns and streets and stuff in the city into those surface waters as well. So last week's rain event likely caused the fecal coliform bacteria counts to go up this week in the lake. The fecal coliform bacteria often increase very quickly when conditions are right. As soon as conditions aren't right, they die off very quickly too. Usually our beaches only have to be closed for a couple of days before the levels go back down. So um, these videos, again, um, we put out on Facebook. Um, it goes directly to our YouTube, uh, city YouTube um, account as well. Um, and then it also gets posted on our website. Um, we also have a Google Plus and a um, Twitter account, so it also gets sent out uh, that way as well. That particular video um, itself um, was hit hundreds of times, um, had many comments on it, and um, was a pretty good thing to put out there because prior to putting that video, video out there, um, we had to post that the beach was closed. And that's when the speculation came out, so then when we put the video out, the true facts really came out as to what was going on with that particular incident. Um, the next video um, actually just went out on Facebook today. Um, it's, uh, it pertains to the Public Works Department using their new brine tank systems that they have on the sides of, of the truck. <clears throat> This year, uh, the Public Works Department uh, is going to a new uh, angle of uh, 
wetting our sand. So we uh, we purchased two units, uh, two wetting units for our salt and sand trucks. And this is one of them here. This is a 50 gallon tank. And we've got another 50 gallon tank on the other side, so it's 100 gallons. And this can hold salt, salt brine, or you can add uh, different magnesium products to it for the colder temperatures. Right now, this one has salt brine in it. And the idea behind it is to pre-wet your sand prior to it being applied to the road. The reason for pre-wetting the sand is that one is salt and sand, the salt needs moisture to work. So by adding this liquid salt brine to that sand, you're activating the rock salt that's on the truck and as it is applied to the road. The second part of it is that you're adding moisture to this product as it goes to the road, which allows it to stay in place where you put it on the road. If you put just dry salt and sand down, after about 18 to 20 cars driving over that, that salt and sand is now blown off to the edge of the road. So the idea is to, in the end, is to use less salt and sand, but have what you put down be more efficient. So by putting liquid to it, it allows this salt and sand that you're putting on to be more efficient and it activates the salt right away and you have instant results with your product. First of all, salt usually works down to about 15 degrees. That's kind of what they say the threshold is after that. It doesn't uh, do a lot. But when you wet your sand, they say you can get about maybe six degrees more out of it because you're activating that salt right away. So you've got a residue that stays there. Now you get down to uh, in the single digits, there is, uh, there's magnesium products that you can add. Though we have another truck that's got some mag product on there right now and that'll get you down into that single digit. But after you get much below five degrees, there's not a lot that works at that point. But with this product on the road, as soon as it does warm up, it all of a sudden it'll start to work again. So the residue that you put down today will work three days from now if, if, it, if you get moisture. So the idea behind uh, liquid application to salt and sand is the fact that you think, gosh, now they're putting more salt on there, but in essence, we want to put less salt on. We want to use less salt. By, by dry applying it, especially on our higher speed roads, traffic is blowing off your product, so you go back out and you put some more down, and traffic blows it off, and we put some more on. It gets to be a, a repetitious thing. We're hoping that this this way of doing it that our product stays where we want it to it's efficient and it's effective right away it's being the salts being activated because it's got moisture added to it so at that point we are uh, right away we've got instant gratification from the salt starting to work and the product currently we're we're buying it from Candy High County uh, Public Works Department we met with uh, their staff out there about three weeks ago and had a little round table discussion with them on how to do it and uh, they, they've they been doing it for a while so they gave us some ideas and, and so they're kind of helping us move forward with it. Um, as we move forward if we decide that we're going to have multiple units like I mean maybe we get into that six seven units that we have tanked up we might have to look at purchasing our own mixing station and and because basically what you're doing is you're taking rock salt and mixing water with it into this liquid state and adding that to your salt and sand the cost of the tanks and the plumbing and getting it set up was about thirty seven hundred dollars and so we had two of those uh, set up for right now and we hope to do two more and by four, that allows us to cover the four quadrants of town, north, uh, southwest, east, and then kind of first street. And um, I'm hoping as we replace units going forward, that this would become standard equipment in all our units. So at some point, all 10 of our trucks would have it on there. But we're hoping to get four for right now. I just realized I may have given you a glimpse into Gary's report coming up when he comes to the council sometime. Um, but the idea uh, and concept behind these videos, again, is to um, try to um, get the facts out about newsworthy events that's going on in the city um, and try to keep them short, four minutes, give or take, um, and to get that, again, out via social media because that's ultimately where everybody um, seems to get the information from. Um, just moving on to the website, um, we're just going to uh, talk briefly about a, a couple um, things that you might um, be interested in if you're if you're looking to find city council videos um, if you click on the the icon there to the right 
will lead you to a chronological order of um, meetings. Um, so if you go and click on like meetings 2018, you'll see we've, we've got um, just a few on there so far this year, of course. Um, but that's where you'll be able to find your agenda packet uh, if there's audio, uh, video, things like that. Um, so far for 2018, we don't have any video on there. Um, but if you go back to home, <coughs> um, you can also go to full calendar. So if you're ever looking for a city council meeting, um, go back to December. And if you want to go to a city council meeting, that box will pop open, which will give you the agenda attachments, and the video is already in that particular one. So if, you, if you're ever looking for and you don't want to go through the entire list, you can just go right back to the calendar, and those videos are um, embedded into the calendar as well. Um, I believe that's all I have. Is there anything? Uh, it is a mobile-friendly <laughs> app or site, so if you don't need to be on your phone and have an emergency last minute of, hey, where's this agenda, where's these minutes or video, you're more than capable of doing that with a tablet or the phone. So. Dave, could you go back to the main, or the home page, and then where it says report a problem? Yep. Okay, so I've had a fair number of contact from citizens, and the concern that they've had is that when they call the city office number, they don't get an answer. Um, and so I haven't had that concern probably within the last two to three months, but has that number always been listed on there? Is that the same number? I believe so, yep. There? Yep, I don't know that we've changed anything. We'll double check on that number. Uh, could that is the regular, that's the regular the number. Fax. Oh, is that the fax number? Okay, yep. well, there's our problem. There, okay, there's the problem right there. So. <coughs> so 4913 is what it's supposed to be, right. I was looking at it at an angle here, and with this bum eye I have, it looked like a three until <laughs> uh, Rudy said it. So yeah, we'll, that's, we'll that's where your that. problem is. So that's why they're not getting an answer. Yep. Okay. So, and I reported that, I don't know how many times at City Hall, but, so. Okay. We solved the problem tonight, that's good. Go. What about the search capabilities? Are they improved also, because I get calls from people that will put a flowers or whatever up there and they can't get to where they want to go. Yes, those actually have improved. That was one of the main uh, items that we wanted to get away from with the site or the old site where you would type in any sort of a term and then it would show an entire Google search on it. As a matter of fact, Cody, can you type in something in the search box, uh, minutes, and that should show up. There we go. Anything internally within our site, if you go down from there, you'll see that it's all got a listed wilmermen.gov site. So it's strictly looking within the city's website. It's not going out and doing, for example, a Google search looking for anything with the word minutes in it. So. How about if you type in parks? I mean, are we going to get sure. locations or? Park Trails, Robbins Island, Rice Park. Okay, so that's this is relatively new then. Correct. Okay. Uh, well, this was uh, this was initially incorporated with the new site. Uh, the old site, like I said, did a massive Google search on it. This one does it strictly within the website itself. Right. And another thing with parks, Cody, you can go back to the home page quick. Um, on the bottom, you'll see a map, and under there, <coughs> this is going to be city map areas of interest. This is one thing that most people aren't aware of. Um, when you click on Explore Map, this will bring up anything of local interest in here, and it can be sorted off to the side uh, by parks, by services, entertainment, attractions, uh, things of that nature. Ross, now when you go to the, not to this, can you click on one of those icons and will it go yes. to that park? It will uh, actually, well, show you information on it, so. Okay. Um, when uh, Councilman uh, Christensen was asking about looking up uh, parks and the list showed up, what can you, can you click on the picture or just a name or how does that work? When you uh, do, a, for example, a search uh, for the word parks, it'll show up the links of any page that has the word park in it. So if you can click on any one of these park trails, it will go to that page and bring you to, for example, here a list of, entire list of the parks. So. The site was made also to basically prevent repetitive information of having the same information on multiple web pages. Uh, it was 
So that way we don't have misinformation going out there. For example, you have a park on one page and then a park on another page. It may have been placed there and then it's two places to update, two places, basically two points of things that could go wrong. Uh, we also designed it to keep the user from having to go more than about four or five <coughs> clicks in to find something on the website, keep it very straightforward. Uh, it's strictly there from a citizen standpoint of what are they going to be or what are they going to look for within the city of Wilmer, and can we get them get them that information effectively? Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Rob, <coughs> does it function the same on all forms of um, computers? And I know that it seems to be different on iPhones or iPads than on um, computers. So, is there some? It will look a little bit different on a mobile device as opposed to a full desktop device. The mobile device. It's obviously going to be a little more constricted on what you see, but um, it still can be navigated. The links are the same. The information is the same on it. Okay. And on the mobile device, too, if you turn your phone or your pad sideways, way. you'll see the full screen. Yep. Okay. Uh, next, we'll have Rudy, and he'll explain uh, a little more on the <coughs> So we've actually had programming on our website for a couple, three years now. Um, if you look where it says Rack TV On Demand, if you click to that, it'll actually open up a separate web page. And we wanted to make sure we really highlighted this tonight because it's been on there for quite a while. Um, you have numbers in front of you of all the statistics that are actually related to the studio. For Cablecast, that's TV numbers, Cablecast on TV. But if you scroll down, you can see we have all of these programs, and I do programming a week in advance. So I just did 12 days of programming today, so the programming is done until Sunday. And if you want to watch any of the programs that we have on our schedule, you don't have to have cable. You don't have to have internet. You don't have to have a computer. You can either watch it on your phone, your tablet. Your, um, you can go to the public library at the community center and watch it. So it, there's no one in the world that cannot watch any of our programming that we have on TV. So, if, Cody, if you can scroll down, you can see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all of those blue items are programs that you can watch without having any cable. So, Cody, if you want to just click, uh, just go up a little bit to, one, to, let's see, just do the girls' basketball game right at the top on 180. Uh, actually, well, it should come up. So the test output, and then if you click on that, that's the last program, that's the last basketball game that we just got in. So local programming, so you can stop that, go back to the, to the schedule. So any of those programs that are highlighted on demand can be watched. You'll see, you'll notice that the council work session and the council meeting are not on demand yet because we're here doing those tonight. I am in the studio at 6.30 in the morning, and I have those um, DVDs come to me in the morning. I create video files for them. I bring them, because the program schedule automatically uploads itself to this website. And you will be able to watch council, uh, either the work session or the council meeting by 7.15 tomorrow morning. So everything is drawn over. I decide what is, is, can go on demand, what can't go on demand. Um, the only things that really aren't on demand are DVDs because they're not a video file, so they're not drawn over. These are the three program schedules. 189 is not on here yet. Uh, but again, everything that you see all the way down, there, there's virtually everything that we have that can be watched on demand. It's been there for quite a while. And that's what we really wanted to highlight because we want people to know that whether they have cable or they don't have cable, they can still watch it. Uh, Rudy, I got a question. You were talking about the basketball. Now, is that something that your team records? Or does that, that does school? Does is there any co-oping with the school? Yep, Dave. Dave takes care of the sports. We've done five sporting events so far this winter. Uh, we are we're, we're going to be recording depending on whether fourteen, but I do coordinate with the schools with song fests and other local events that 
the, the school has, I work with them and I get them a camera and then they record it and then I take it over from there. So the recording is about, you know, one third of what it takes to, to get a program on. Then it needs to be made into, I, actually the basketball game was shot on Friday. I did it this morning. So I got the video, I brought the video into a software program, I edited it, brought it to a DVD, took about two and a half or three hours. Once that was done, I made it into a video file. I got it into the program schedule, put it on TV, and then it went on demand. Usually it takes around 40 minutes, depending on how long the program is. So if you look, again, there is an awful lot of programming that's available, not only for TV, but also for anyone who wants to watch it online. Could you refresh us again on the amount of money that Rackgate brings in in franchise fees annually? Uh, last year, our budget was set at 140, 140, 143,000. We spent uh, $16,000 on the new equipment and replaced equipment that was 34 years old. And now everything is a video stream. So that was the exception. We spent about 160,000 every year. The franchise agreement brings in 260,000. So depending, we have nothing for capital improvements for next year because we didn't we we didn't have time to get in anything to do HD here at the council. We're look that's the big next thing that we're looking at adding. If there's support from the council, would be to change this equipment out. Uh, this equipment is fine. It's not the greatest. If we lose a camera, we can't buy a new one. So what we like to do is upgrade it to HD. I'm working on uh, some information with Charter. I'm looking at pricing. And then what we would do is, so this camera, these cameras and this equipment is not going to go to waste. What we did in the past, the last time, is that these would go to the school district. And the school district would have, if they want to, they would pay to install them. The city would still own the equipment and then we would let them use that equipment because the school board equipment is horrible. And we want to be able to upgrade it and then still get a number of years of use out of this. So 260,000, we spent 160. So if you look at the numbers, the city has an additional 100,000 plus per year to do whatever it would, the council, whatever they would like to do with that extra money. So when you said you, uh didn't have any money in for capital improvements for next year. Is that, is that 18 or 19? That's, that's this year. 18. Yep. So we didn't put anything in for this year because it, 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 we, we didn't know that we were going to get a complete upgrade. We got the fourth channel and the HD channel outside of negotiating of the last franchise, mm -hmm. the, the prior one. And it, we got very lucky in that they upgraded the system because what we're doing is replacing equipment that was put in in 1986. And now all the video that we have is IP based. It's a multicast stream. So it's, it's a video stream that we're sending. It's the most current technology. In fact, Charter supplied the equipment to us and it was specifically made for us. We're the first test site to use it. Uh, and it, it's, it's been working great. The quality is, is unbelievable from what we were getting before. So we hope that that's going to completely change the way quality is that we're going to get. And then, again, we'd like to add something with council here next year. And uh, we're looking at you know, the possibility of somewhere around maybe 75000 to do that. But we hope that we could get that support considering that if we do that and put it in the budget for 19, you know, our capital all the projects and numbers won't be much higher after that. So the city will have, well, depending on when the franchise gets done, if, if there's 100,000, you know, per month, you're looking at, you know, over a million dollars that the city could use for whatever it would want to use it for, for whatever you decide to use it for out of, the, you know, going back into the general fund. You meant per year, not per month. Per month, per, per well, 100,000 at least per, oh yeah, per year. Yeah. And then over the, sorry, over the franchise agreement, if it goes 10 years would be, you know, a little over a million. Sure. Rudy, if, some, if there's a community event or someone has a concept for a program, what do they need to do or how does that work to get something 
um, I, I had someone approach about a yoga class. Yep. In fact, we're working on that right now. Okay. So they come in, they usually call me, and then I try to find out what the best way it is for them to shoot it. Uh, if it's in the studio, we can help with that. But this the yoga one was actually done outside of the studio uh, where they just checked out any equipment, and then they would come in, and then I would help them you know, work on the program with the editing part of it. So we're working on that. We're also working with the community center. There, uh, Darlene Schroeder, who's there, is working on recording all of the entertainment that they bring in, which just started back up. She actually shoots it, edits it, and then brings me video files. So that makes it really simple. So I think that there might even be, go back to Tuesday if you can, Cody, on 181. Or is it 188? Right by, right by his cursor is where it's at. Right. Oh yeah, 180. So if you go to Elmo Wick, right where your cursor is at 11 o'clock on demand, that's actually one of the videos that she did. So if you just click, click play. Well, there we go. So that's community center programming. So I work with her to do that. But um, we've also talked about uh, there's a, a person that's coming in and looking at doing a grant for some programming to highlight the community for next year. We're talking about doing that. And then also working on the possibility of doing a, a Somali-based program, too. So people can just come in. They can call the studio, find out, explain to me what it is that they're looking at doing. And then we take it over from there and find out the best way to shoot it. Okay. The programming that was talked about before that's on Facebook and on the other, is there any way for you to incorporate that into Rocky? Uh, yes. I just need video files. Okay. Yep. Okay. Councilman Palmer. Thanks for the presentation tonight. Um, huge improvement in, in not only function, but I think form. And uh, after talking with our administrator uh, some time back about uh, his vision for this, it, we kind of saw eye to eye on some things because um, uh, I feel like a city website, because it's, it's the city and the city belongs to everybody, this is our city's website. So making it more user friendly and having more functions uh, that are that are easy to navigate and all that that's a that's a better reflection on our town and especially those who would be thinking about coming to town um, employers and other citizens and whatnot so huge kudos because I, I think you know functionally it looks like it's laid out really well and uh, looks like a lot of time and effort because there's a lot of content there that's if you look at our numbers that we have for cable casted programs and you look at what we have on the website with one full-time person and then Dave, who was, was a part -time, permanent part-time person last year, there's nobody in the state that has more channels than we do or more programming with relationship to the size of our city Thanks. and the technology. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to mention too, if you uh, just scroll up again, Cody, there's a couple things over to the left top. If you click, if you're in a, a community, uh, if you, if, if you have a, an event and you live in the community, uh, whatever it is, if you go to that community announcement request form, you can actually send me the information and then I will make an, a bulletin board announcement. I also, we also have those on our bulletin board. We don't have a screenshot of that, but that has the weather, it has all of the program schedules, and then it has the community announcements that are available on there too. And then if you just go back once, or actually if you just go there, and then down just below the search, right above channel 180, you can also go to the YouTube page there. So again, this is another spot where you can find local city programming. Um, right now we have the holidays parade that's up there right now. That'll be replaced on January 27th. I spoke with uh, Chief uh, Felt and we're gonna be, I'll be out recording the Polar Plunge again. That video usually has some of the highest views of any of the videos that we have on. But if you scroll down, you can see another place where you can find all of the city council meetings. If you scroll down, you have our local um, programs that are also available somewhere on there. We go up a little bit. Oh yeah, playlist. This is different than what we have. So there are City Connection, you have City Mini, you have the Do You Know Show, um, and, and another entity, another place in, to go to do those. Last year, uh, we had $3,000 cut from the temporary employee budget. So we did 
very few local event programs because the council added the work sessions. So we went from 24 meetings to 48 meetings and we only had enough money for temporary employees of $600 and then only covered five meetings and didn't cover our cleaning person or any of our local host people that we used. We did manage to do the Wormerfest highlights, all of those, the Grand Day Parade and the Holidays Parade this year. We just kind of snuck in under budget. I think the last time I looked, we were exactly at budget. I don't know how the final numbers are gonna turn out, but it, it kind of hurt a little bit because that money was eliminated, so we had to kind of hold off on something, so. But Councilman Rasmus. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question on the community center. I know that they are wanting a calendar and I know they've been working um, with IT. Where are we at on getting a calendar of activities for what's happening at the community center? Um, I'll actually defer that question to uh, Mr. Bresen, at this point, I know that his department has been in contact with, I believe, um, the community center to potentially get some kind of a calendar set up for that. <coughs> Way to defer it. That's, that, that's called a deflection, right? Yeah, very nice job. Uh, there has been conversations, Julie, as you know, at our last meeting that was discussed further. I, I, there's nothing etched in stone as to the development of that and how it's going to shake out. Um, Darlene, in, in the work that she's doing, has to uh, get into our department and start working with Pam on, on the layout of what they're looking to do. And once that happens, then we'll get all IT and see how we're going to implement that in the future. And then let me add one more thing, too because this is where TV comes to the rescue, we do have an announce, a bulletin board announcement. I've been working with them for a couple years now. So as the bulletin board scrolls through, it has at least five weeks of all the, the community center entertainment that's listed on TV. Okay. I thought it had gone back to the IT and that they were looking at how it was, that calendar was gonna get placed into the city's website. And then you would click on each day to see what all the activities are. I would just say basically I think we're waiting to hear back from them is, was the last thing that I've heard. Um, we can certainly put it on there. That's not a problem. Uh, we haven't gotten any information back once we sent it back to Steve for them to coordinate with Darlene. So. Okay. So is it a matter of a coordination between Pam with the schools and the city's IT? I would say yes. So um, why don't we just avoid the middleman and have Darlene contact Dave directly, and I'm sure a city administrator will write a note and make that happen. So I think we'll get it taken care of. And it's also in the community and rec book. That's where I got it from. But I think all of the programming for the community center isn't in the, it doesn't come out with the community and rec book. That's where I get the current one from. That's why I think the middleman is the community and rec staff and that the work that is being done at the community center needs to be um, in collaboration with all the other activities that are taking place. And I think that's where some of the lack of communication has taken place between community center um, volunteers and the staff at community and rec. So I, I think that has to happen so that the understanding is there as to what needs, what content needs to be placed in and who's leading that charge. Mr. Allen, can you kind of uh, shepherd that however it needs to be shepherd, shepherded? Right. That's such a word? Right. I, I will do that. And yeah, there seems to be a disconnect there somewhere. So we'll try to uh, balance it out to make sure that we get everything covered. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilmember Nelson. I was just going to ask if the city gets notified of a community event, do they share it with Rackate? Because I know we've had conversations about our own calendar internally also, and maybe this is an opportunity to look at how do we share community events so that they're more available both on the website and on Rack 8 and available to us too. Correct. Pretty much anything that we receive that would go on to your um, council calendar 
in terms of community events, uh, Dave posts those right away to Facebook, and we field those over to RAC. So. I, I meant to imply an administration, too, if they get information on community events also that it gets shared with that. Councilman Christensen again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are we getting anywhere with the franchise agreement? Are we on hold? The current franchise subjects? agreement, yeah, correct. We did send a response back to Charter based on the decision and guidance that we developed at the cable committee. Uh, that had been reviewed and sent back in December, and we're just currently waiting at this point for Charter's response back to the city. So. If, I, if I remember right, I think this was due in December of 16. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. The franchise officially expired, I believe it was January 3rd or, well, 3rd or 4th of 16, but it was extended until the end of uh, 2017. So okay. At this point, it's basically on a month-to-month -month extension basis. I, I, I think... Um, Council Member Alvarado. Thank you. Um, it isn't a, a black and white kind of issue uh, between uh, charter and and the city and the state that so there's a lot to the pieces and it isn't something that's um, coming together um, easily as I recall uh, with uh, charter um, they're taking a different stance so um, I just want you to be aware that it isn't um, not for the lack of trying to I get something resolved. We're trying to do that. However, um, it takes two to dance, and um, right now um, there doesn't seem to be a wanting to dance. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, oh, Councilmember Osmus. Okay. And as long as we have you here, it's timely. Um, as far as the cable board, what do we have for openings? Where are we at? There's, did we fill them? There's one spot left open on okay. the cable advisory board. Um, I'm sorry? Four terms expired, and so you found three already? Uh, yes. <laughs> it was on, it went through council. I would have assumed that you would have been notified at the last count, after the That's last correct. Meeting. There is one open spot at this point. Right. So my understanding is one open spot, and I was waiting to hear back from Susan Matson. Okay. I have not heard back from her yet. Once I hear back from her, we'll determine whether there's a position to fill there or not. Otherwise, all the positions are filled. Okay. And I maybe we can make sure Janelle gets that information to Ross or Rudy so that he uh, has that information. But it was approved at the last council meeting. Everything was all approved. So. Thank you guys for your report. Thank you for the work that you do. Keep up the good work. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next, we have our, our police chief in a violation of Wilmer City Ordinance Number Four Fifty Seven. Chief Felt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, item before you tonight is the, to uh, discuss a violation of Ordinance Number Four Fifty Seven involving a potentially a, de a dog deemed potentially dangerous, and uh, the potential remedy for that. A little bit of history here is uh, Wilmer City Ordinance 4-57 outlines procedures for the Animal Control Authority, which is Wilmer PD, to designate potentially dangerous dogs and impose restrictions along with procedures for violations of the ordinance. We have one dog in Wilmer um, that's classified as potentially dangerous that has had <coughs> numerous repeated violations. The owner's been cited, the dog impounded, and the ordinance procedure is for the, uh, originally for the Public Safety Committee, uh, now directed to you at the full council to review and order actions concerning the dog. Um, a little bit more history is that the dog involved here is a three to four year old male husky dog that lives on uh, the 1100 block of Dana Drive in Wilmer. Uh, calls for the dog first started in April 2014. Since that time, Wilmer PD has investigated six calls of neglect, 12 barking dog complaints, one aggressive dog complaint, one dog on dog bite complaint, involving this dog where no uh, veterinary attention was required, and two human bites, uh, one in 2015, the other in August of 2016, that both required medical attention for the people. The dog was deemed potentially dangerous on August 26, 2016, and with that came some, uh, some special um, restrictions, including that 
Um, they had to ensure rabies vaccinations, had to be under the control of an adult with a leash no longer than six feet, current city dog licensing and proper enclosure to keep it confined. Um, we've had uh, numerous problems with the dog since, the most recent being it was sighted and impounded two separate times within the last few months, one in November and another on December 28th for dog uh, running at large. Right now the dog is still confined at the uh, Hawk Creek Animal Shelter and we're looking for uh, uh, the council to review this and um, give some orders to the, uh, the dog owner as outlined in the ordinance. Our staff has been in contact with the Humane Society and what the recommendations from them, the Humane Society and our staff is um, that the, uh, the council order that the, the dog owners provide proof of the completion of the rabies vaccination series for the dog, obtain a current city of Wilmer animal license, which they have not complied with, uh, that they uh, neuter the dog to decrease the aggressive tendencies and inhibit wandering, and to do the above uh, items within 30 days of the dog will be considered surrendered to the Hawk Creek Animal Shelter, where they'll make the determination if it can be adopted out, if not adoptable, uh, possible euthanization. It's the Wilmer PD's goal for animals is to uh, gain compliance from the animal owner and not to euthanize any animal unless absolutely necessary and we'd ask you to, uh, to consider the above recommendations. You know, Chief, the sad thing here is it's not the dog's fault. It's the owner's fault. And the owner is failing to take proper actions and to be accountable for their actions. And it's a very sad day when it has to come before the council that the council needs to make a decision uh, based on the fact that a human is not behaving appropriately at the expense of an animal. And uh, it's a very tough spot that the council gets put in. So, council discussion. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Chief Belt. Um, a couple of questions when I was reading through this. Three years is a long time. Um, this happens to be out in the neighborhood that I live in. In fact, when I was reading through it, it probably has been in my yard. And we have issues with dogs across the street also. And I'm just curious, we don't enforce the dog license policy. Would you review that for us? If we had enforced the dog license policy, could we have stopped this two years ago or three years ago? Or what could we do to take steps? Um, I feel sorry for our neighborhood, but I also feel sorry for the dog. And I'm just wondering if there's anything that we could be more proactive to do to stop these things going on in our neighborhoods. Because I know we have other situations right now in our neighborhood. Sure. where people don't bother to call the police anymore because they say nothing happens. And so uh, also um, I was an advocate for the dog park and the dog park is supposed to require that there are dog licenses, but we don't enforce that either. And so I'm just curious with what we can do to pick up the pace to protect both the animals and the people. And so back to the dog license, what would a dog license, how could we enforce that? That's, that's a great question and uh, you know with that comes some challenges too. Uh, when we deal with dogs that are loose, uh, especially dogs that are impounded and brought to the animal shelter, uh, they'll require a license for, their, um, for them to be released back to the owner again. But uh, we don't stop people on the street and check if they're walking their dog if they have a license or um, you know, go knock on doors for that. And there's some legal issues you know, on when they're on private property for um, you know, when times when we may ask that and may not. Um, you know, in, with this particular dog too, we encourage people to call on any animal. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, they did have six calls of neglect on the dog in, de in looking through those complaints. Um, some of them were concerns about food and shelter. Uh, they were met that way and it's kind of like raising your kids where, um, you know, people have different ideas about, or disciplining your kids, what, what the appropriate level might be. You have to kind of go by the letter of the, the law and they did have adequate food and shelter in most cases for that, or we're given corrective action. Um, the barking dog complaints they have to be barking for a certain amount of time uninterrupted in order to cite. Uh, there was a lot of talking with these owners and, and without citations, but it, it, it is difficult. You know, we don't have anybody stationed out at the dog park to, to verify that, uh, uh, and I'm not sure the best way to, to do that either. But. May I follow? I believe the, the city of Minneapolis has a, has a off, you can let your dog run off leash, but you have to get an off leash permit. And they actually do stop and check 
people um, with that. I mean, when people have to stop walking on the streets because they're afraid of the dogs that are coming, it, I just feel like that we should be looking at some other things to both be proactive for the dogs and for the people who, who live in our communities. Certainly. The, uh, the, the ordinance in Wilmer here does require the dogs be on a leash and mm -hmm. the invisible fencing around someone's <clears throat> yard or you know, simply opening the back door and letting them run is not um, allowable by ordinance too. So, mm -hmm. but again, you don't always get good compliance on that either. So is this a situation that we should have done something sooner when you look at the number mm -hmm. of issues or is there something that would have helped you to be able to do something sooner? In this particular dog case here, there were a couple times where um, there wasn't good communication between the officers and then our officer that's in charge of animal control where they could have possibly been cited, but they were given a warning instead. So there was a little, couple, uh, there could have been some earlier interventions here that were missed on our end. Councilmember Plowman, follow up with Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, aside from this, this dog being a, a danger in the neighborhood and a danger to uh, other animals <coughs> and citizens, this incredible drain of our public resources, the amount of time that officers have spent on this, this is absolutely ridiculous because there's a lot more um, serious human matters that are going on all the time. I'm wondering if, um, if beefing up that, that city ordinance regarding these types of instances, putting more well, putting more teeth, sorry for that, but putting more teeth into the, uh, uh, into the ordinance so that we can, uh, just like Audrey mentioned, uh, head this off in a proactive manner so that there's more that, the, that our law enforcement is able to do without the council having to, you know, without it having to come to something like this where we gotta decide, you know, whether or not a dog's gonna potentially be euthanized. Um, and yeah, any, any moves that we can make, I think, to beef that up to um, prevent it from happening again, because um, heaven forbid somebody get hurt in the meantime, or you know, as the result of another animal that's been, you know, because I'm sure this is not the only animal in the city that you get repeated calls on. And so, if we can head it off somehow, um, fully in favor of that. But I, I think that's what we should do. Councilman Christensen, thank you. Who handles the dog complaints? CSOs or a regular officer, full time? Depends on uh, staffing levels and, and availability. Usually during the daytime, it's our community service officers that, that handle it. Um, you know, after hours, nighttime, or if the, the CSOs are busy doing other things, um, our patrol staff will handle that. And do they actually catch the dog then and impound him? I mean, if, if something's out of whack? Uh, if at all possible, yeah. They do? They do. Even the CSOs? Yes, yeah, especially the CSOs, they're very, <clears throat> They're very uh, zealous about that and carry treats in their car yeah. to that type of thing. So. Okay, so they're trained to do that then, evidently. Yes. I mean, okay, thank you. Oh, Mary Nelson? I, I definitely feel we need to be proactive on this. Um, I, I mean, your recommended action is, is to follow what the Humane Society is recommending and what you're recommending, correct? Correct. But I think there's also a request for us to take a look at moving this to the council meeting, and, and I would be supportive of being um, getting this resolved as soon as possible. Councilman Meski. I just have a couple of procedural questions. This animal was deemed a potential dangerous animal by Animal Control Authority? Correct, which is our, our, our an officer in our department. Okay, and then the reason it is here is we are the substitute for the public safety committee is that correct yes uh, since we no longer have a public safety committee that's why it was brought to the full council work session okay but then it also could be it says Wilmer public works it can also hear that hearing or is that a combination i'm just reading the policy and a procedure c it's the committee that's the old committee the name of the old committee is public works public safety Safe. public works safety it's the same committee Okay, so I guess for me, I'm looking at this as, is if, if the police force has deemed this as a potentially dangerous animal and it's listed out here very clearly, it seems to me that coming to the council level to make a determination case by case seems, I don't want to say it's a waste of our time, it's a very, it's a very serious concern, but it seems to me that a mechanism could be put in place where it doesn't have to go to a full council meeting to do with this. this is, 
obviously you're doing your due diligence in public safety. Um, so I guess I would review the policy and because I mean there's obviously some old language about committees that we don't have now and maybe a way to streamline this where if it falls within those purviews of what is designated as dangerous and you continue to get requests that we can streamline this process and not deal with it at a city council meeting. I believe the statute requires us to deal with it. Is that correct? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, no, when the animal has been uh, designated as a potentially dangerous dog, there's no requirement that it come before the council at all. Your ordinance gives the property, or excuse me, the animal's owner that right if they want to appeal the designation to come to the council. But at the potentially dangerous level, it's not required that the council make a determination or even weigh in on um, the conditions that are going to be imposed on the animal. The one thing I would say is it is clear in your ordinance that if the animal is to be uh, destroyed, right. which is an option under the ordinance, it does have to come from the council. That's correct. Uh, right. I should say from the former committee, which is now the, the council work session. Right. And that's, that's what I was inferring is what, because it's we're talking about euthanizing the dog, at that point then it comes to the council. The rest of it happens outside of the council, but, but because that possibility is there is what brought it to us. That's what brought it, I, Correct. my understanding, that's what brought it to you. Right. Yeah. So that's understandable. <clears throat> Councilmember Nelson. I, I really would like to see us pick up the pace on dog licenses and cat licenses and enforcement of that. I don't know what the answer to that is, but I do think it would be beneficial to the entire community and for people not to have to worry about their neighbor's dog running loose. Okay. So do we have consensus to move this to the council for action? Okay, well, Mr. Holland will move that forward. Next is the Civic Center ice replacement. Mr. Christensen, our Public Works Director. Up to you. Why don't you come up here? We like seeing your smiling face. <laughs> Mayor, members of the council, what I should do now is just turn it over to Steve Brizendine so that he can talk from back there. But um, I've got very few. Very few short slides here, and what we need to do tonight is um, have a discussion on the um, path we're going to take on this refrigeration project. So previously, and I'm going to kind of summarize, previously the uh, council has approved uh, a dollar amount to fund the, what I would call the base option for this refrigeration project. <clears throat> what I'm going to present to you today are the three options that we have been discussing with our engineers. And what I am going to be recommending is um, increasing that dollar amount to recommend a different option than the base in order to um, plan for the future, in order to um, have some expansion possibility or availability for this, for this facility, um, anticipating that when this, when this um, planning document that you guys have approved comes forward it will it will show the potential for expansion of this of this facility so that being said what am I push here that one this one here is the first um, option I got three options as I mentioned so this would be the one that uh, you can see in the bold letters at the bottom the the uh, council has approved um, what was the dollar amount the council approved again? 2.6 million. 2.6, right. Yep. So that, of course, uh, Mr. Mayor, would cover this project. Now, I see one typo in my spreadsheet there, and that is on the very first line item that says um, room for the resurfacer, and I don't believe that is included in this particular project. What this one does in a nutshell is, uh, is project A would be building of uh, uh, an ice facility for exactly what we have now. So it's simply replacing what is there with one refrigeration unit that would 
do both re both arenas, both ice rinks, um, instead of the two. That would be the big change. But uh, effectively, we would be replacing um, those two ice uh, plants with one, and uh, in the in the existing configuration. I see another typo up there, but I'm not going to be on it long enough to let you find it. Um, option B would. Uh, <clears throat> take those t same two sheets of ice, one refrigeration unit for both sheets of ice, but this one adds an additional room. That first line item, again, is, is the big change. Um, it adds a, an additional room for the resurfacer, for the Zamboni unit, that would allow it to um, fully use your last line item up there, which is um, the heat recovery system, um, so, that, so that the system of the Zamboni, the resurfacer itself, does not have to go outside to dump the snow and ice, come back in. Um, thereby losing obviously your your heat that you've contained inside the the in building envelope, as well as um, wear and tear on the or wash down the wheels actually <coughs> wheels and tires of the of the zamboni as it comes back in before it gets back on the ice. So this project B is the same two sheets of ice two sh two sheet system, but it adds additional space for this uh, zamboni room. Um, as you can see at the bottom line there, that adds 100,000, I'm rounding numbers obviously, adds 100,000 to the, to the uh, number that the council approved here recently. Um, and, and to back up a little bit, I think what, what happened was when uh, the council approved the 2.6 million, I think um, we didn't have solid numbers yet on the, as you can see here, conting contingencies, engineering, and things <clears throat> of that nature that we have obviously need to add to the construction I think the 2.6 was probably closer to the um, construction project itself of the, um, of, the, of the recommendation that I'm going to make, which is Project C. This adds the capability or capacity for a three-sheet system. Um, knowing full well we don't have three sheets yet, but anticipating in the next, let's say, 10, 15, <coughs> 20 years, if it's a 30-year system, that we may have a third sheet up there. And this would anticipate that and be able to tie into that system um, rather easily and, and uh, get a third sheet of ice up there if, if that's what this or future councils decides to do at some point. Um, you can see the two, actually two big line items that change is uh, your, your building expansion. There, the first line item for the square footage of this, of the electrical and resurfacer room. That dollar amount increases um, as you move up from A, A B, and C projects. And then the last, I'm sorry, second to last line item, and that's the, uh, the system itself, or the ammonia system itself, refrigeration. And this particular sheet, three sheet system is, is 1.4 million. What this does, unfortunately, uh, as you can see on the bottom line, is, is a $3.3 .3 million number and adds in round numbers again 700,000 to the number that you, that you all uh, approved uh, recently. And as you can see, um, Details wise, if you add the contingency and the engineering up, you're already at 900,000 just for those two, those two numbers themselves. So that's where the dollar amounts, I think, come from and, and go to, quite frankly. The other couple pages on this, on this uh, slideshow is, oh yeah, I want to do that, it doesn't change yours, are the three different options as might be um, located on the system or on the, on the site. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner of each of, this, each of these. Um, areas of this page is the Cardinal Arena, and on the left side would be the Blue Line Arena, and then so this would be outside of, on the northeast corner of the Blue Line Arena in all three cases, and you can kind of see just schematically what kind of size difference we're looking at depending on uh, which system we, we uh, choose to do. Um, further, you can tell or you can see that the top of each of the shaded areas on projects B and C is the Zamboni or the resurfacer room with that uh, heat recovery um, system in the in the right right hand corner upper right hand corner of that. This is just more of an aerial view of what that might look like. Um, you know, zoomed out a little bit, and I think nope. And that's the same same way as this. So this is a refrigeration room itself, and uh, if you do the Zamboni room, it would be to the north of this. You can see uh, what happens is one of these. Uh, okay, so up above the refrigeration room here, the Zamboni currently comes out here, 
parks over here somewhere, dumps all its ice, snow and ice coming off the blue line, and then comes back in the building where it has to do the wash down of, of that system or of that, of that facility or that uh, uh, vehicle each time it, before it comes on the ice again. Um, and that is all the slides I have. I can answer any questions you might have um, or more details of, of the project itself. Sean, before you take questions, could you talk about the timeline? I feel it's important as you talk about the three options because there is some differences. Sure. So the original timeline was was uh, hurry up, get it bid, get it, uh, get a contractor in place because the contractors, there's a very few of them that do this type of work, this refrigeration specific work. So get them on board, get them going so that they can just the day after we we have ice come off. They can start going and getting this thing built. You'd be back up and running by um, around the 1st of October sometime. It's a very short window for this type of, this size of project. As well as what happens if we do that, um, we actually lose that first month of the season that we've gained the last couple years with the Warhawks coming into town and, and things of that nature and, and early ice. Um, we get a little bit of revenue from some of the early ice uh, tournaments and things of that nature. So. That was the original plan Sean, was to get in and Sean, can I, I need to interrupt that a little bit. It's even more than that. It's the 26th of October was estimated completion using that time frame. Okay, so yeah, so first of November then instead of the first of October. Thanks. So we've lost that month or six, five or six weeks, you know, at the beginning of the season, um, of all the seasons, I should say, um, of ice. And that is um, predicated on the fact that if, if you get into a project like this and nothing goes wrong, which you know, none of our projects have anything go wrong with them. So that's, you know, kind of easy to jump to that conclusion. Um, the other option is to, to bid it a little bit later, get the design done correctly, bid it a little bit later, get these contractors on board, and they will do the outside portion, the outside building, the, um, any of these configurations, the refrigeration room, this is all done outside, and uh, get all that done in the summer. Meanwhile, for next season, using the existing systems we have in hopes that they stay, can, we can band-aid them enough to get them going through one more season. And then during the season, build the system, build the refrigeration system inside the buildings that were built this summer and then still be on board for the, the new system the summer of 19. And so that's kind of what we're leaning towards now, regardless of what we decide, so that we're not rushing a contractor, we're not potentially up in that um, contract price, uh, bid price, to cram it into to a four month or five month um, time frame, and at the same time losing losing some of the the uh, you know a month of or five or six weeks of the season. So I guess my recommendation further would be to increase the the bonding requirements or the bonding recommendation to allow for Project C um, uh, to allow for the three sheet system and then also um, extend that schedule a little bit so that we're constructing the outside portion of the summer, but yet the uh, refrigeration system next winter. Is that kind of what you're thinking for a little more, a little longer than you anticipated? <laughs> now I'll take questions. Councilmember uh, Alvarado followed by Plowman and Meske. Um, would, uh, would you please go to the uh, overview sh outside shot of the, um, the, right there. Where, where are you saying, where are you saying that the new ice is going to be? Is it up here? Um, Council Member Alvarado, I'm not saying anywhere at this point. But what I am saying is that with the, with the refrigeration system right here, there's options to have a, another sheet here parallel to the Civic Center arena. There's, you could have it back here, anywhere in, this, anywhere in this vicinity, even to the point of potentially out here, you could run refrigeration lines to it if that refrigeration room is right here, which is what we're proposing at this point. So I'm not indicating where that third sheet might be at this time. Okay, okay. Um, is the idea that the, um, the uh, expanded room for the resurfacer would be able to do two sheets of ice? Um, on projects B, it would do two sheets. On C, it would do three. Uh, I'm sorry, the resurfacer do two sheets of ice? Yeah. Very possibly. If you, if you do a, 
I, I misunderstood. So if you do the resurfacer room right in this area, mm -hmm. and you do a sheet out here or back here, then I can I could see that happening. Absolutely, mm -hmm. have kind of a garage system. Um, there's a number of rinks around that that have one central garage, if you will, for the zambonis and, and the resurfacers, and they can do do uh, send two onto one sheet of ice, or if something goes wrong with one of them, you can. In our situation right now, you've got to run one around the outside to get to the other to the other rink. Okay. But That's the intent would not be to downsize the number of Zambonis because you No. The ease of getting to the Civic Center Cardinal Arena is not there with where this is going to be located. No, and I'm not intending that. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking it was kind of um, a good idea to try to have that uh, Zamboni resurface <coughs> in an area where it could address. Okay. Right. In an ideal situation, you'd have a big garage right here that could, and then they could run back and forth between the two, but that's, that's not the current situation we have. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember <clears throat> Plowman followed by Meske followed by Nelson. Yeah, my, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question was kind of the same, along the same line as uh, the new, where the new refrigeration unit would be. Is that the optimal configuration, kind of having a centralized refrigeration uh, resurfacing area kind of centralized amongst your facilities, I suppose? You know, uh, Councilmember Plowman, it is. Um, as it is, as we've proposed right now where that refrigeration room is, we looked at about three different options of, of where to put that. This one is the, is the, is the least um, brine line length, if you will, the least amount of piping to get to the existing two rinks and also allows us the op opportunity to have a third sheet that's in the vicinity so that you can continue to have shorter, shorter uh, piping. One option we looked at was back here, you know, close to where the existing Civic Center rink is, but then you've got to run piping all the way around the building to the blue line. And so for the existing configuration of those two buildings, of those two sheets of ice, yes, that's, that is the, the, the least amount of piping in the most ideal location. And I imagine if we were to take on a system that could handle a capacity of three sheets, the less piping the better, which means we can use a more efficient system instead of upsizing again. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Meske followed by Nelson. I was going to ask a very similar question too. So I just, I would say, um, if you think about a third, we haven't seen all the plans yet, the facility, but a third sheet of ice, if it came with a long-term lease agreement to help pay for that extra cost would be great. Absolutely, and I, I don't disagree. I haven't seen any plans yet either. We're just getting underway on that, so. Councilmember Nelson followed by Councilmember Christensen. I too is gonna ask about the location and if there's anything preventing it from the design, but I think I've heard enough about your explanation with why you chose that. It's unfortunate that it's coming before the plan is done. Um, and I'm just curious if, um, if you are now proposing that the ice that it not be done in 2018 and wait till 2019. So the design though needs to be done and the project would actually be started. So when we when will we be seeing the master plan? The master plan is being kicked off uh, uh, this month. And so all of the proposals we got for the master plan was a six month process. And so I would say you will see um, preliminary um, <coughs> Tentative plans, I would say you could see them as early as, as uh, spring, you know, and 30 to 50 percent completion potentially. But uh, I would say summer would be the, a great time to see a completed master plan for that area. Um, and and I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a disadvantage at all that we're doing this first because, again, w these two sheets of ice are not moving. Um, they're always going to be there. And so we're not proposing a full new facility. We're not proposing anything like that. And so we have to take care of what we have um, currently. Um, and then uh, you, your other question was what? Oh, the, the construction schedule. No, I'm not, not pretend, or I'm not uh, proposing to wait all of it until next summer. I'm proposing to do the dry portion of it, if you will, the building portion of it this summer to, to lengthen that construction schedule out, if you will, is probably a better way to look at it so that um, we don't lose any time on our s potential summer programming, uh, the summer of 19, we will not lose anything on that. The only difference will be in s we'll have the new system up in place for the winter of 19 instead of the winter of 18. I, I just know there's a concern that we've been on borrowed time 
with yep. this with this and then there are not replacement parts there so yep. just was thinking about that the second part of my question was um, the bonding when we had 2.6 in the budget last year or it, for this for 2018 right. correct right was that all being bonded or was that cash what portion I mean what are we looking at now how does it change the bonding or, or sure. what you're proposing for financing <clears throat> sure and I've talked to uh, mr. Okins about that a little bit and he couldn't be here tonight but my understanding was that that was all bonding um, but that it could be changed to a, this additional funding um, all the rules on that I'm not 100% sure on and that would be um, a finance question but my understanding is that that 2.6 was bonding and then the, which is what the 2.3 would be okay thank you councilman christensen followed by osmus i'm assuming when you say third sheet you're talking about curling i'm not assuming anything at this point okay it, wouldn't it be prudent for us to uh Look at where hockey, the numbers in hockey are going in the next 10 years before we'd even think about a third sheet or even having the uh, facility accommodate three sheets. Um, I, the numbers aren't growing uh, the, the, in hockey. The, uh, should I say, the, the, when the second, third, and fourth graders seem to swell in numbers. And then they start to drop after that. And then don't you think we should look at that prior to uh, thinking about a third sheet or the facility that would accommodate that? Uh, Council Member Christensen, I agree with part of your statement and disagree with, with another part. The part I agree with is absolutely we should look at that before we build something, um, build that third sheet, if it's for hockey use, hockey or figure skating use, you know, that type of size. Um, curling, of course, is a little different size. And so we, we absolutely need to look at that. Um, for whatever that third sheet is, we have to look at that use. Um, I don't necessarily agree that we should wait to build this system until then, because right now is as cheap as we're going to get this third sheet capacity on the system. Um, we'd have to do on these on these line items again. You would have to do most, if not all, of those line items again mm -hmm. for an additional system separate or to add on to the system in the future. So. Um, and then as far as the numbers go, um, I don't know that the numbers, I think the numbers are looking great, by the way. I mean, I know this is a conversation for another, another time, mm -hmm. but what I heard from the hockey community was that they ran out of gear at least one year, if not two years in a row, for the little guys, granted. Mm -hmm. But uh, that being said, if you lose the same percentage, then it, it looks good for the numbers in the future. I didn't mean to uh, delay the building of it, but I mean from going from two to three, uh, it needs to be looked at pretty hard because that's seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I mean, and then uh, the the bonding. You know, we could pay cash for this with with the amount of reserves we have, and uh, I would suggest doing that. I mean, we've been sitting on the reserves for years and years and years and years and waiting for a rainy day. That's what we say they're for. Well, here's a rainy day because when we bond, it's that, that means the taxpayers got to pick that up also for ten years. Yeah. Um, and, and you're, you're exactly right, uh, Mr. Christensen. I, that was part of the conversation I'd had with Mr. Okins was that was another option that the council could choose to, to use was, was to pay that cash and then, you know, repay yourself if you need to back to the reserves. So. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Rasmus. Thank you. I would like to see us build for the future. I think we have a history of, of being short-sighted and not and just taking care of what we need right now so I would be in favor of building it I, I think um, the interest in curling is increasing I do think that's going to be an option we're going to have to look at in the future my fear is um, council member Nelson started to allude to it but we didn't say what the solution was is you know the the hurry the the, the urgency was to fix that ice before, uh, to see if we could get it through this season. If we try to cripple it, get it through another one, and it doesn't work, and it does break down on us, what is our, what's our backup plan? Um, Councilmember Osmus, the backup plan right now, as it has been for the last couple of years, is if the fact that we have two systems. So if one goes down, we'd have to shift everything to one sheet of ice. That puts cramp in everybody's schedule, I understand that. 
Um, and if it happens to be the Cardinal side, then you know you got a seat, you got a capacity issue, you got every a lot of issues there on the on the blue line. So the backup we have in place is that yes, it's you know held together. Yes, we're holding our breath. Yes, we're banding bandaging that. The backup we have is the fact that we do have two systems. So if one goes down, we still have one sheet of ice that we could get by if 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 the you know that kind of emergency happened. Sean, if I could add, that'd be a catastrophic failure in the system as well. We've had failures in the system um, probably five in the last eight or nine years that have variable amounts of uh, fix to them. And whether that's been a $3,000 fix or last, uh, last year's $18,000 fix, um, in many cases, most things that would go wrong, we would be able to accommodate because these systems are still out there. Um, what we're looking to do is to plan for the future when these systems aren't out there. And yes, we do have aged systems, but they are, um, and the engineers, want, when they talked to us about our timing of this, uh, stated that, that your systems are in good shape for the age that they're in. You know, you have been living um, with them and, and they've accomplished what they're supposed to. You've had some troubles with them, but the reality of it is they're still functional systems that minus a catastrophic thing that hasn't happened um, we should be as Sean said you know in in good place uh, we might lose a week we might lose two weeks but I don't I don't see something short of you know total failure causing us to lose a whole season I do my my fear is you know if we had to muddle our way through weekly uh, uh, you know, curling league stuff or um, some hockey practices. We can we can work through that. But when we have great events like we had this last weekend, like the Bond Spiel, or we have a major hockey tournament that's in town, and that's a lot of heads on beds and a lot of revenue coming into the city, I I would just hope that we have the plan to be able to say we're still going forward. We don't have to cancel those kinds of events. That we uh, we have some type of solution. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor Calvin. Two more, two part questions. Okay. So. First part, I know there's a lot of families that go, that leave town to go practice somewhere else. Do we have any idea how much practice time that different groups are, are using other facilities to rent that if we had that capacity in one form or another, you know, how that might work for us. I, I know there's a concern about the future and we don't have all that information yet, but I do know there's a lot of families who, who drive on a regular basis at the beginning of the season to go somewhere else to use the ice time. So I'm just sure. curious if any of that calculation has been done. It, uh, Council Member Nelson, it has been done by the, by the people that have done it. Um, of course, I've got my own checkbook that would show you for the two that I travel different directions, but um, I don't know that I have, I could get that to you. I don't know that I have a, a, an exact number for you, but I could get it in a short amount of time, an, an estimate of, because the coaches, the, the, the youth and the high school, coaches at all levels know how many of the <coughs> players are traveling, and we could get that for you pretty easily, but I don't have that in front of me. Second part of that question is I know in the five year, if we're looking at capital improvements for five years, there's talk about bleachers out there. There's talk about other improvements. If we're going to do bonding, and I don't know what the solution is for financing this, but if we're going to do bonding, wouldn't it make sense to finish some of the unfinished items out there that are on the waiting list that have been removed because it haven't, you know, in, in, do we have any other safety things that should be done out there? Is this the time if we're going to take the steps to do bonding to finish some of those things so that we aren't looking at, at more expense in the next five years for the Civic Center? Yeah, and my, my short answer to that would be this is the time to do the refrigeration with this bonding. Um, I think that is our biggest um, expense as it pertains to potential loss in, in um, income and in people coming in more so than like some of the other projects you mentioned, the bleachers and some of that, which has been put on hold because of this project. So um, like I say, the short answer would be, this is the time to do the bonding for the refrigeration system. Okay, my understanding is, is that there was a concern that we move this forward to the next council meeting, to the council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, is that still your desire or is your desire to wait until uh, basically eight days 
and then deal with it through a normal procedure? Is this an emergent issue or not? You know, initially I thought that I would try to convince you it was an emergency issue, but the fact that it's eight days away and, and our finance director is not here, um, and if we're considering waiting and spreading the construction schedule out, I think it could probably wait. Okay. And then the only other thing that I wanted to point out is that in, on option three, you have 900000 in contingency, over 900000 in contingency. If you were to remove that 900000 in contingency, you would be 100000 plus under what the council had budgeted and told you to go forward with. So um, I understand that you can't take contingencies out. But and that's not entirely correct. And if I can interrupt you, the contingencies is only three hundred fifty thousand. Well, the rest have, of that, uh, the rest of that nine hundred is engineering. You have uh, okay twenty percent engineering, administrative, and legal, and you've got uh, contingencies of uh, uh, three hundred fifty-seven thousand. Right. So you're exactly right. I mean, if you don't use the contingencies, you've saved three hundred fifty thousand dollars. But it's not nine hundred. Okay, I was adding both of correct. The and, and, and I mentioned 900 earlier. Yep. So that's not the typical engineering that we add to our street projects? That's not the same thing? No, it is. It absolutely is. Okay. So I'm saying the same thing. I, I don't think you are. <laughs> the contingency is 350000 The engineering is 550. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't drop all the engineering because then we don't have a project. There's potential to not use all of your contingency. Correct. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. So there's not a desire to move this forward. Anything else that the council has? We're a little bit past our uh, adjourning time. Anything else, Councilmember Christensen? Just one quick. Uh, the the mention mentioned the fecal account or uh, account at Robbins Island in the water. How about in the sand? Is is that the danger too? I mean, it gets washed into there after rain, they said, and so is it in the sand? Is that a problem? Maybe somebody could check on that. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, you, you caught me off guard. I was talking with our city clerk. You talking, could you repeat your question again? The, the fecal count at Robbins Island in the water. Yes. They stated that it, it, it gets worse when it rains because it washes out from the, the driveways and the pathways and the sand that's there. Yes. So is it in the sand a danger? It's you know, I, I did ask the question. The reason I can respond somewhat is I did ask the question after I reviewed that video and I talked with, you know, Jim and Sarah down there. And primarily she told me that it was based upon more of the uh, wildlife uh, activity at the lake. That was 90% of the problem. It wasn't from the streets or from, you know, human activity. Okay. Councilmember Meskey. Well, I was just going to bring up a couple of things. Um, we'll call it projects that I wrote down and I haven't got answers to. Um, <laughs> we had the Camille Morse Nicholson report, the meeting when we were over at the county building about conducting better public meetings and digital public engagement. And I was curious if we are going to ever have a discussion about that because we did get an, an agenda of future work, work meetings. I'd like to see that. In particular, I'm more interested in that digital public engagement. In light of seeing the website, I think there's some potential we can actually do some engagement with the public on some of the projects we were thinking about doing in the future through the website. If that's not a possibility, I'd like to know that because perhaps uh, some of us may go out and do some information gathering and information on our own if, if the city's not going to do it. But I think that there's an opportunity for the city to kind of use that site for that. And I was curious, uh, so we had um, during the public, public comment last time, about a semi-owner, and I, we didn't hear back if there's resolution or did the staff get a hold of those folks. So just a couple of things that are on my radar screen that I, I want to make sure we follow up on. So did, yep. did staff get a hold of the people with the semi? Yes. Okay. That, that, was, that one was answered. But, but we weren't, the council wasn't advised of that. What was the answer? Well, I, I don't want to say off the top of my head, but I, because there was two different trucks and the chief's now out of the room, but um, yeah, those but, those were resolved and I thought everyone was copied on that, but you're saying you didn't get copied. No. Okay. I can follow up on there, that, but that one was resolved. No. And I don't think it was, the short answer to that, Mayor, was the homeowner was not happy with the answer. 
Okay. Motion to adjourn. We don't have okay. to make, we can't make motions. No. Nope. So anything else? Otherwise we will uh, recess or we'll adjourn to the next meeting. Okay. We'll adjourn to the next meeting. Yeah. That was they wanted that the street changed.